Are you tired of that old worn out pipe and that old worn out blend? Well, you need a new Peterson pipe. Peterson's have the utmost quality. Produced in Dublin, Ireland. Guaranteed to be a great smoking pipe. Get your Peterson pipe today. Contact your local tobacconist. Get out those old records, those old phonograph records, the ones we used to play so long ago. What if they sound scratchy, the tunes really were catchy, and especially those that said, I love you so. I used to beg you over and over just to set the wedding day. To get you portable, I'd bring my portable and melt your heart away with all those old records, those old phonograph records, the ones we used to play so long ago. Those old all the ones about records, those old all the ones about records, the ones we used on to the play so long ago. ago. On the old wind up Victrola, Barney Google was great. The tunes all the songs really about Kate, and special those that said I love you so. Yucca hula hickey I used to beg you over and over just to set the wedding day. To get you portable, I'd bring my portable songs and melt your heart away with all those old. They were wonderful records. Those old. Play them over again. The ones we used to play so long ago. The ones we used to play so long ago. But I'm not the type to care Cause I've got a pocket full of dreams It's my universe Even with an empty purse Cause I've got a pocket full of dreams I wouldn't take the wealth on Wall Street For a road where nature trods And I calculate that I am worth my way in golden rod Lucky, lucky me I can live in luxury Cause I've got a pocket full of dreams type to care cause I've got a pocket full of dreams it's my universe even with 
an empty purse Cause I've got a pocket full of dreams I would take all the wealth of Wall Street For a road when nature tries And I calculate that I am worth of my way In golden rods Lucky, lucky me I can live in luxury Cause I've got a pocket full of dreams The legend lives on from the Chippewa on down the big lake they call Gitchagumi The lake it is said never gives up her dead When the skies of November turn gloomy With a load of iron ore 26,000 tons more Than the Edmund Fitzgerald weighed empty that good ship and true was a bone to be chewed When the gales of November came early The ship was the pride of the American side Coming back from some mill in Wisconsin As the big freighters go, it was bigger than most With a crew and good captain well seasoned Concluding some terms with a couple of steel firms When they left fully loaded for Cleveland Then later that night when the ship's bell rang Could it be the north wind they'd been feeling? The wind and the wires made a tattletale sound and the wave broke over the railing And every man knew as the captain did too T'was the witch of November come stealing The dawn came late and the breakfast had to wait When the gales of November came slashing When afternoon came it was freezing rain in the face of a hurricane west wind When supper time came the old cook came on deck saying fellas it's too rough to feed you 7 p.m. a main hatchway gave in He said, fellas, it's been good to know you The captain wired in, he had water coming in And the good ship and crew was in peril and Later that night when his lights went out of sight Came the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald Does anyone know where the love of God goes When the waves turn the minutes to hours The searchers all say they'd have made Whitefish Bay If they'd put 15 more miles behind her They might have split up or they might have capsized They may have broke deep and took water all that remains is the faces and the names Of the wives and the sons and the daughters Lake Huron Roll Superior Sings in the rooms of her ice water mansion Old Michigan steams like a young man's dreams The islands and bays are for sportsmen And far 
weather below Lake Ontario Takes in what Lake Erie can send her The iron boats go as the mariners all know With the gales of November remembered In a musty old hall in Detroit They prayed in the Maritime Sailors Cathedral The church bell chimed till it rang 29 times For each man on the Edmund Fitzgerald and The legend lives on from the Chippewa Down of the big lake they call Gitchagumi Superior, they said, never gives up her dead when the gales of November come early.
Well, welcome to another Kadra hour. A very hot August Kadra hour. And um, yeah, so we've got the Edmund Fitzgerald wreck and the Titanic. So I thought I would talk a little bit about both. I have always been fascinated with the Titanic growing up as a child. And um, I did some little more research, uh, particularly about pipes and tobacco on the Titanic. Uh, and then the Edmund Fitzgerald, I find very, very um, horrific in my mind. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, of course, it's still a mystery of how it sank. But, um, uh, you know, as you guys saw on the, the thing, the, the, I think the most popular uh, theory is that it actually dipped down, hit the bottom, and then a rogue wave ripped it in half. I mean, that's just crazy. So I thought I'd read you a little bit about the Edmunds Fitzgerald first and then get on with the Titanic. The Edmund Fitzgerald, this is from Wikipedia, so was an American Great Lakes freighter that sank in Lake Superior during a storm on November 10th, 1975, with the loss of an entire crew of 29 men. When launched on June 7th, 1958, she was the largest ship ship on North America's Great Lakes, and she remains the largest to have sunk there. She was located in deep water on November 14, 1975, by a U.S. naval aircraft detecting magnetic anomalies, and soon and found soon afterwards to be in two large pieces. For 17 years, Edmund Fitzgerald carried taconite, a variety of iron ore, from mines near Duluth, Minnesota, to ironworks in Detroit, Michigan, and Toledo, Ohio, and other Great Lake ports. As a workhorse, she set seasonal haul record, records six times, often breaking her own record. Captain Peter Pulser was known for piping music day or night, for piping music day or night over the ship's intercom while passing through the St. Clair and Detroit rivers and entertaining specters of spectators at the So Locks with a running commentary about the ship, her size, record-breaking performance, and DJ Captain endeared Edmund Fitzgerald to boat watchers. Okay, so carrying a full cargo of ore pellets with Captain Ernest McSorley in command, she embarked on her ill-fated voyage from Superior, Wisconsin near Duluth on the afternoon of November 9, 1975, en route to a steel mirror, steel, steel mill uh, near Detroit, Edmunds Fitzgerald joined a second taconite freighter, the SS Arthur M. Anderson. By the next day, the two ships were caught in a severe storm on Lake Superior with near hurricane force winds and waves up to 35 feet high. Shortly after 7.10 p.m., Fitzgerald suddenly sank in Canadian waters, 530 feet, about 17 miles from Whitefish Bay near the twin cities of Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, and Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, a distance Edmund Fitzgerald could have covered in just over an hour at her top speed. Edmund Fitzgerald previously reported being in significant difficulty on the, uh, to the saltwater vessel Avifors. I have a bad list, lost both radars, and am taking heavy seas over the deck, one of the worst seas I've ever been in. However, no distress signals were sent before she sank. Captain McSorley's last message at 710 to Arthur M. Anderson was, we are holding our own. Her crew of 29 perished and no bodies were recovered. The exact cause of the sinking remains unknown, though many books, uh, studies, and expeditions have examined it. Edmund Fitzgerald has, may have been swamped, suffered structural failure or topside damage, grounded on a shoal, or suffered, suffered from a combination of all of these. The disaster is one of the best known in the history of Great Lakes shipping. Gordon Lightfoot made it the subject of his 1976 hit song, The Wreck of the Edmunds Fitzgerald, after reading an article, The Cruelest Month, in the November 24, 1975 issue of Newsweek. The sinking led to changes in Great Lakes shipping regulations and practices that, that included mandatory survival suits, depth finders, positioning systems, increasing freeboard, and more in frequent inspections of vessels. It is very interesting both the Titanic and Edmund Fitzgerald changed a lot of things after they sank. Um, sometimes I think our hubris as human beings 
and gets the best of us. And yes, I am enjoying my Peterson pipe tonight, the Peterson Kinsale XL20. And in it I have Paladin Black Cherry, which this is affectionately known as the Paladin Pipe. This is the pipe that, yeah, really started it all. First pipe I ever tasted anything out of anyway. So, I thought I would tell you I'll go through just real briefly and then I'll go over the Titanic. There are different theories of how she sank. I mean, they're haunting. Let's see here. If you guys look on Wikipedia, there is like a ton on it. And I, and I you know, that uh, the artist's rendition of the drained lake, and you can see how it was ripped in half. I mean, it, you know, is. Um, Gordon Lightfoot said, the good ship and crew were a bone to be chewed when the gales of November came early. Uh, yeah. So, one of the hypotheses is the waves and weather. So, it says Edmund Fitzgerald sank at the eastern edge of the area of high wind where a long fetch or distance the wind blows over water produced significantly significant waves averaging 23 feet to over 25 feet. Uh, so 23 feet uh, at 7 p.m. and over 25 feet at 8 p.m. The simulation also showed one in 100 waves reaching 36 feet and one out of 100 reaching 46 feet. Since the ship was heading east-southeast, it is likely that the waves caused Edmund Fitzgerald to roll heavily. At the time of the sinking, the Arthur M. Anderson reported northwest winds of 57 miles per hour matching the simulation analysis results of 54 miles per hour. The analysis further showed that the maximum sustained winds reach near hurricane force winds of about 70 miles per hour, with gusts to 86 miles per hour at the time and location where the Edmund Fitzgerald sank. So the other one is called the rogue waves, the three sisters. The three sisters phenomenon is said to occur on Lake Superior and refers to a sequence of three rogue waves forming that are one-third larger than normal waves. The first wave introduces an abnormally large amount of water onto the deck. The water is an, an unable to fully drain away before the second wave strikes. And then the third incoming wave adds to the accumulated two backwashes, quickly overloading the deck with too much water. Cargo hold flooding hypothesis. So this is one, basically, they didn't, from what I understand, I'll just sum it up because it's long. They didn't take care of their hatches very well, and they think that maybe one of them uh, was compromised and it took water that way. Um, the shoaling, I think, is the, the, the scariest. And, um, I mean, you know, first time I ever watched that simulation, they were you know, most likely they were going down under underwater and coming up all the time. And, and I think it happened to those guys a lot. And they were just figuring, okay, it's going to dip down. It's going to come back up. The waves must have been enormous enough to displace that much water and have a shoal that high to where it goes down and then it rams into it. And then that other wave came over and just broke it in half. And that's kind of the, the one that I go with. I am no expert in, in maritime stuff, although I am fascinated by it. Um, but man, that's haunting. Um, and then there's another one where it says they basically had a stress fracture in the hull and then uh, just the rough waves and everything just made it, you know, uh, structurally fail. And so it actually split from the bottom. So yeah. Edmund Fitzgerald, what a wild, wild, wild shipwreck. Um, so as I said, I'm dedicating all of this to the, the men who lost their lives on that and all the people that lost their lives on the Titanic. So, all right, I'm gonna pause for just a second and I'm gonna get all my Titanic literature. So uh, hang with me. All right, guys, we're back. And a little break there, Mrs. Paladin came out and uh, she gave me some compliments on the room note. And uh, 
gave me, actually, because she knew I was doing this tonight, 100 unsinkable facts about the Titanic. So, um, for those of you who may not know, um, which if you don't know, I guess you've been living under a rock. Uh, the Titanic was a ship that was built in 1911, uh, and it sailed on April 15th, uh, excuse me, it sailed on April 13th, uh, 1912, uh, and it sank April 15th, 1912 in the North Atlantic after hitting an iceberg. Uh, and it uh, took uh, 15, uh, 1,517 uh, women, men, and children to the bottom of the ocean with her. Um, it is a wreck that I have been absolutely fascinated with since I was a child. Uh, my wife often says that she thinks my previous life I was on the Titanic uh, because I am fascinated with shipwrecks, like I said earlier, but uh, they scared the living hell out of me ships do, um, sailboats and everything. I mean, I've been on them and I get on them and there are always bad things that happen to me. I don't know, something about it. So, uh, but here are just a few facts and then we'll get to some kind of fun stuff about the pipes and cigars uh, that were on the Titanic and the people that smoked them. At the time of her launch, the RMS Titanic, which stands for Royal Mail Steamer Titanic, was the largest man-made moving object on earth. What's really funny is, it's another side note. I know a lot about the Titanic guys and a lot about White Star Line. I think they were kind of cursed. Uh, the Olympic was darn near close there and you could argue that it was a little bit, I believe it was a little bit longer. Uh, somebody's gonna fact check me on that and that's fine. But Titanic could haul more. I think it had more tonnage, I believe. Uh, the Titanic at the time cost $7.5 million to build. The White Star Line's Titanic and her sister Olympic uh, were designed to compete with the famous Cunard liners of Lusitania and Mauritania. Uh, Lusitania is another sad one, guys. Um, the Titanic's wake was so huge that at its launch, it sucked in another ship and almost caused a colli collision. The Titanic featured an onboard swimming pool, a gymnasium, a, gymnasium, a squash court, I'll throw out my other notes over here, uh, a Turkish bath, and two separate libraries, one for first class passengers and one for second class. Notice there were none for third class. Very interesting class system back in 1912. The top speed that it could go was 23 knots, about 26 miles an hour. The Titanic originally was designed to carry 64 lifeboats, Safe from cluttering the decks though, she ended up only carrying 20 on her maiden voyage. Which we all know, if you have uh, studied any Titanic, was um, that was part of the fateful part of the whole voyage. Um, and there were only 706 passengers and crew that would survive the disaster. One of those uh, survivors uh, is Violet Jessup. This is weird. She's a nurse, was a nurse. She was on the Titanic, the Britannic, and there was another one that she was on. Maybe she might've been on the Olympic, and the Olympic never sank. It was the only one that never sank. It had collisions, but it never sank. But the Britannic and the Titanic, of course, sank. Um, and they some called her like the, well, some called her the, the like, uh, like the kiss of death, the, the death angel, um, because you know everything she was on, it sank. Others say she's just a survivor and that she kind of like the unsinkable Molly Brown, you know? Um, so some of the premonitions of the doom was a passenger and fashion writer, Edith Rosenbaum, call, cabled her secretary in Paris that she had a premonition of trouble about the Titanic and she survived. Governess Elizabeth Schutz was so unnerved by the smell of the night air on April 14th that she could not fall asleep. She told fellow passengers that the smell reminded her of the air inside an ice cave she had visited, and she survived. William Edward Minahan, a doctor on the Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, had his fortune read shortly before the voyage. The fortune teller predicted his death aboard the ship, and she was right. Now, this is a novel I have read as well, and this is freaky as hell. 
the plot of Morgan Robbins Robertson's novel Futility bears an uncanny resemblance to the Titanic disaster. The novel tells of the story of the Titan, the largest ship ever built, billed as unsinkable, which strikes an iceberg in April and sinks. In the book, more than half of the passengers die in the North Atlantic because of the lifeboat shortage. The book was published 14 years before the Titanic sank. That is actually true. Now, there are a few little caveats different. The freakiest thing, freakiest thing, is that the book, Futility, gives you, gives me goosebumps on my tail, it, it gives you the specs of the Titan. And if you guys ever want to get really nerdy, look it up. Maybe, you know what, I'll put a picture. I'll put a picture here. So Morgan Robinson's Titan description and the Titanic. And really the only difference is, is there was more sails on the Titan. Um, and it actually in the book kind of ran up on the iceberg. It hit it and kind of went up onto it and then uh, broke and then just kind of slid back into the ocean. And then the, again, there weren't a lot of lifeboats. Um, really good story. There's even a story about a polar bear. I mean, it's really good. It's not very long. So if you guys can find a copy of it, it's hard to find. It took me a while to get it. Um, definitely, definitely, um, you got to read it. So, okay, I'm going to go through here. Um, here you go. The cost of the most expensive first class parlor ticket to New York was $4,350, which was about $69,600 today. The first class dining saloon was sheathed in hand cut mahogany paneling. The first class smoking lounge was for men only. First class passenger Eleanor Widenor wore a famous multi strand pearl necklace that was valued at $250,000. Many of the first class passengers left the Titanic still dressed in the silk evening gowns they had worn to dinner. A new Renault car was part of Titanic's cargo. Okay, that's just the interesting part. The Titanic was stocked with 20,000 bottles of beer and stout, 1,500 bottles of wine, 8,000 cigars, and 1,000 pounds of tobacco, all for use by first class passengers only. Check that out. The last dinner served in the first class saloon consisted of 11 courses. Buglers called first class passengers by dinner by playing the roast beef of Old England. First class passengers were given copies of the White Star music book containing 352 songs so they could make requests. The musicians had to know all the titles. And the last little interesting, only about 60% of the first class passengers survived. You know, we went to the uh, Titanic Museum in um, Gatlinburg uh, a few years ago. And uh, that's an amazing, incredible museum. Uh, they've got a deck, or excuse me, the, uh, uh, isn't that horrible? My mind is not working tonight, guys. Um, the bridge, they've got a bridge that is exactly like what it was. And you can walk out and they've got the air cold. Feels just like it was on that night. You can kind of faintly see an object that could be an, could be an iceberg. Uh, and then they have water that is right over the side that you can put your hand in. And it's the 28 degrees that the North Atlantic was that day. And it's cold. And um, they've also got different pitch, uh, 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 pitches that you can stand on to try to hold on to if you were on a guardrail as it was, you know, turning up to sink. Freakiest one is you walk into the third class area, and uh, I guess we just must have hit it at the right cue. You walk in there, and the lights flicker, and the glass that, well, I didn't think there was glass there, and that's the thing. The glass that they have looking down this third class passenger. Uh, cabin, you know, hall is so clean, like you see right through it, you don't even see it, okay? And you just, the lights flicker and you hear, whoo, and then all this water comes rushing at you, you know? And, and you're like, whoa, and, and of course it fills up and there's a there's a plexiglass between you and it and then it drains and then it does it again um, every so often. But that, whoo, that, yeah, that gets your heart racing. Uh, so let's see here. Um, 
to show you here. This was a first class smoking room. I did, I printed off color pictures for you guys. Now, truth be told, I tried to do this Codger Hour way back in April uh, because, you know, the Titanic sank in April and I wanted to do it as kind of a memorial. Yeah, YouTube shut that down. Uh, so I had to be really clever about this one this time to, to get it through on YouTube, and I did. So, um, yeah, so here's another first class, a view of the first class smoking room. Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about it. It was located on A deck off the aft grand staircase. Landing was a late night lounge where first class male passengers could congregate, socialize, discuss matters of business and politics, smoke, drink, and play games of chance, except on Sundays. In keeping with social conventions of the time, the room was exclusive to men. In order to recreate the same atmosphere of a gentleman's club, the room was decorated with dark mahogany paneling inlaid with mother of pearl and richly carved. Numerous large stained glass windows were installed in pediment niches within the paneling. Illuminated from behind, uh, illuminated from behind. Like the lounge, the ceilings and window were raised above the level of the boat deck by increased height and the room was flanked by alcoves with bay windows, also in stained glass. The floor was laid with blue and red linoleum tiles and the plaster ceiling was molded with plaster medallions. By the way, linoleum, if you had linoleum in your home in 1912, you were a millionaire. So you guys are all millionaires because I got linoleum in my home, so, you know. Um, let me get really lit here. I'm talking too much. But Titanic, like Superman, has always been fascinating to me. So... In the center of the far back wall was a Norman Wilkinson painting, Plymouth Harbor, which hung over a coal burning fireplace in white marble. This was the only real fireplace on board. The others were installed with electric heaters. Square tables with raised, raised edges to prevent drink spillage in rough weather dotted the room. Surrounded by round club chairs upholstered in leather of an unknown color, probably green or burgundy, to the right of the fireplace was a revolving door which led to the veranda cafe. The room was a U-shaped, was U-shaped because the ventilation shaft from the turbine engine room occupied the forward uh, end and to vent out smoke from the fireplace, cigars, and pipe smoke. This area also included the bathrooms. So, you know, vent or stink. The smoking room was the preferred spot of gamblers who crossed the Atlantic. Professional card sharks also traveled on, uh, under, on board under aliases, and the purser could do nothing but warn passengers about these swindlers, since passengers played at their own risk. At least four professional players traveled on board the Titanic. Cigars, pipes, and drinks could be made available upon request of the passengers, and they, provided, and they were provided by the stewards of the adjacent bar. The bar opened at 8.30 a.m. and stopped serving at 11.30 p.m., and the smoking room itself closed at midnight. It was in this room that William Thomas Stead quietly read a book during the sinking. Also in this room, standing at the fireplace, was the ship's designer, Thomas Andrews, reportedly seen here shortly before the ship foundered. This story, which was published in the 1912 book, Thomas Andrews, Shipbuilder, came from John Stewart, a steward on the ship who, in fact, left the ship in lifeboat 15 at approximately 1.45 a.m. However, a contradictory account by Cecil Williams Fitzpatrick places Andrew on the bridge just before the Titanic sank. On Britannic, the smoke room took an L-shaped and had a different design. So this guy, I think was one of the heroes. That is Commander Lightoller, Charles Lightoller. Pipe smoking man till the day he died. He was in World War I. He was on the Titanic. Um, I could go on and on. He was a hard nosed sailor who didn't take no shit from nobody. And he definitely um, got some flack for how he handled the Titanic fiasco. But overall, I still think. 
he's a hero. He actually died during the big uh, smoke event, or, or where they had all the um, the bad smoke fires in England. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to read all this to you. But uh, I would I would highly recommend you look up Charles Herbert Lightoller. I think he is an amazing, amazing man. Um, but he definitely always had a pipe going. Um, and as a matter of fact, I think there was one of the quotes, and I'm not going to look it up in here, but uh, that said. Had he not had his pipe with him on the Titanic, he might not have survived. Uh, but I wanted to show you this. This was recovered. This was, um, I think, McBride's pipe, I think. Or Murdoch's, William Murdoch's pipe that they recovered from the Titanic. Good old apple. And I believe there was also a picture. There was a corncob pipe that they pulled from the bottom as well. Uh, well, again, I can't find it. Um, and that was actually in the um, Titanic Museum. Oh, and then one last thing here, and then we'll wrap up, is uh, Captain Smith. He was the captain, and no one really knows what happened to him. Um, some say that he was last seen on the bridge. Some say that he uh, was last seen handing a baby to a lady in a lifeboat and then drifted away. They're not sure. Uh, but he was a very seasoned captain. Um, yeah, it's interesting. And then the most recent events uh, a few months ago with all of the uh, Titanic um, submersible that imploded. I don't believe everybody should go down to the Titanic. I don't. I think we should remember it. And I don't also believe everybody should climb the summit of Everest. Um, there are some things you just, you know, if you got the training and you've got, you know, you respect it and everything, cool. But, you know, just because you got a bunch of money and you pay for it, that doesn't mean that, you know, you're any more special. Anyway, I hope you guys will take a second during this Kadra and remember the men and women and children uh, who passed on the Titanic, as well as the men on the Edmund Fitzgerald. And with that, as always, we'll see you very soon on another Paladin Piper video. Take care, guys.